morning, I want to ask you to go ahead and take a seat, and we are going to turn our attention to, to God's Word as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. And I love that this is a tradition here at this church to take the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day. This is the day that we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. You ever pause and think about how strange it is that we do this every week? What are we doing when we take the Lord's Supper? We are commemorating the death, the burial, the resurrection, the atonement, and the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to prepare for the Lord's Supper this morning, I want to direct your attention to um, a classic text explaining how important it is that we think rightly about the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So grab your Bibles and look at 1 Corinthians 11. This is an incredible instruction, but it comes in a context that's an incredible rebuke. Paul is actually rebuking the Corinthians because when they come together for the Lord's Supper, it actually uh, does not promote the unity that exists among the people of God because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It actually promotes factiousness and selfishness because they are self-absorbed when they even meet together. And he describes that from verses 17 to 20. Two. And so what Paul does is he instructs them once again on the Lord's Supper, really, and starts getting after it here in verse 23 to 34. And I want to read that together, so just follow along as I read. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. All we really have time for this morning is just to make a few pertinent observations from this passage to help us in our own hearts as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper. It's important to remember, in spite of all that's been said about the Lord's Supper throughout the last 2,000 years, it's important to remember that this is done in remembrance of Christ. What's happening here is not something that's uh, an efficacious partaking in a a bread, a, a cracker, or juice to represent the body and blood. It's actually a remembrance, and Jesus actually said that twice, and Paul records that in verse 24, and then again in verse 25. When you take the bread, when you take the cup, this is done in remembrance of Christ. We are remembering something that was finished once for all. Christ lived a perfect life. He died on a cross once. His atonement work is over. It has happened It is finished. And so we're actually remembering that this morning. We're celebrating that. Whatever sin you might be, you might have in your conscience, just thinking about the remembrance of the once for all sacrifice of Christ is a reminder that there's nothing left that needs to be done to take care of whatever is on your conscience. Only the shed blood of Christ and only the once for all sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ could clean a guilty conscience. 
Notice what Paul says in verse 26. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And I find it kind of interesting that in all the discussion, there's a kind of a popular argument happening among theologians about how do we think about the presence of Christ at the Lord's Supper? Well, you know what the the actual emphasis is on? The actual emphasis is on on, on his physical absence. He's not here. Of course, he's here. He's He's omnipresent. He's here by his spirit, of course. But we're remembering that Christ has has left and he's not here. We're celebrating his personal return. Jesus Christ is coming back to the earth to rule and reign. And that's actually what we're celebrating is the anticipation of that moment. Paul reminds us even that we're doing this until he comes. Christ himself said in Mark chapter 14, verse 25, that he wouldn't drink of the fruit of the vine until he drinks it anew in the kingdom. He's not going to drink from that last supper before he was crucified. He's not going to drink it again until he comes back to rule and reign on earth. And here we are drinking it without his physical presence in anticipation. But the last paragraph is probably where we have the most questions. We're about to partake of the Lord's Supper as a church, as a church body, as, a, as a, the body of Christ. And we know from verse 28 that we need to examine ourselves. And it's true, it's a singular command here. Verse 28 is, a man must examine himself. And and, and the idea is, every man must examine himself. Each man. It's third singular. So there's an obligation we have. There's some scrutiny necessary. And sometimes the scrutiny necessary can, can sometimes cause us doubt. Well, yeah, you know, what if I look at my life? You know, what if I look at last week and I scrutinize myself and I'm thinking, here's the perfect once for all finished work of Christ, and I'm remembering that, but man, look at, look at me, and I'm not, am I, am I worthy? And if you look back at last week and you see sin, okay, well, that's, that's probably why you need the Lord's Supper. But what are you scrutinizing yourself for? Because clearly the, the weight of this paragraph is that we could take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. So we don't want to just throw up our hands and say, well, great, I got sin, I qualify, I'm ready for the Lord's Supper, because there is something you could do unworthy. Well, notice, in 28, we're supposed to examine ourselves. Each man must examine himself. In verse 29, it says that he who eats and drinks, drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. And this is actually a very helpful addition to what Paul is saying. He's helping us understand that what we need to judge, make a judgment about is the body. As he goes on, he starts to describe that there are people in the body who are sick, weak, and a number even sleep. Only Christians sleep, because when Christians die physically, they're, they're still alive spiritually, and so they go to sleep. But there's been absolutely devastating chastening on this body because they are partaking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner at times, and And verse 31 then says, if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. So there's a judgment that has to be made. And in verse 31, this judgment is plural. In verse 32, when when we are judged, this is also plural. We are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned. The Lord is doing judgment, but we also must make judgment. And what judgment are we making in verse 29? The body. This is a judgment about the church. Judgment about who's in the church. Of course, the body is used for the church. It's all over 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, the body is not one member, verse 14, but many. And it goes on to use the body, the physical body, as an analogy of the church. But what's interesting is that Paul is writing a letter to the Corinthians where they have a lot of problems thinking rightly about the church. The way that they think about any of the issues listed from 1 Corinthians chapter 7 through verse 16, any one of those issues, you could say this church is thinking about this in a really selfish way. I mean, it could be talking about um, uh, marriage and um, purity and immorality. We could be talking about liberties. We could be talking about spiritual giftings. We could be talking about giving of financial gifts for the sake of the gospel ministry. And in all of these topics that Paul jumps in and tackles, he is documenting how their self-absorption and their really a poor ecclesiology is, is, is hurting them. In fact... The best parallel passage to that verse, it comes in chapter 5, and I want you to turn back there for a second. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 13. At the end of this paragraph, 
at the end of this chapter here, this last paragraph, Paul writes this. I wrote you in my letter. He's talking about a previous letter before 1 Corinthians, a letter we don't have. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Here's, here's, here's what's really important. Listen to verse 12. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do, not, do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. When he's talking about judging the body rightly, he's talking about recognizing somebody who is part of the body, who does have access and who does benefit from the death and burial and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, we would not be judging the body rightly if we weren't practicing the discipline that Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 5. And we would not be discerning or examining ourselves rightly, not just simply because we happen to see something sinful and something wayward and something godless in our thinking last week. But when we profess the name of Christ and we are not willing to give up what he's called us to give up. And so we must examine ourselves corporately in the plural fashion, verses 29 to 31. We must scrutinize ourselves individually in, as in verse 27. And as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, that's hopefully a help for you to think about what Paul was getting at when he's describing if we take the Lord's Supper while unwilling to give up worldliness, living a carnal life while professing the name of Christ, we will drink judgment to ourselves. And if we partake of the Lord's Supper as a church, unwilling to judge those who are within the church, then we would be condemned. And that's the judgment that Paul wants the Corinthians to avoid as he writes a very sober, penetrating rebuke to them that becomes an encouragement for us as we prepare our own hearts for taking the Lord's Supper. I'm going to ask the men to come forward with the elements, and uh, they're going to pass a tray and it has two cups in it. The bottom cup has uh, a wafer that represents the, the, the bread, the body of Christ, and the, the top cup has the juice. Um, if you are not in Christ, or if you're looking at this paragraph and you're wondering, you know, I'm not sure when I examine myself, I'm looking at my life and, and my life seems to be categorically different than what the gospel calls me to, then I would encourage you to heed this warning and to, to not take and so drink judgment on yourself. Um, as, after the men pass the elements, I will uh, come back up to uh, close this in prayer, and you can take the elements on your own.